Hi, and welcome to another edition of The Right Stuff. I'm the queen, Parker J. Thank you so much for joining me. I've been telling you guys all this month, we are going to be discussing sci-fi tropes, sci-fi horror tropes via a biblical perspective. And today with me is my guest co-host, Mike Duran. I've known Mike for about five or six years now. It may possibly be longer. He's been on the show before, but it has been some time. And now you're going to hear from him today. And then you're also going to hear from him later on this month as we showcase his updated edition about Christians and horror. I can't wait to talk about that later on in the broadcast. Now, today we're going to talk about something really trippy, guys. We're talking about quantum mechanics, multiple dimensions, and ghost. Trippy, huh? <laughs> Let's go ahead and get right into it. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine, Parker. How are you? I am so glad that you are here. I'm doing great. And we're going to have just a great time talking about it. Uh, Mike and I have no plans. So there's no schedule here. There's no outline here. We're just going to dig right in. But before I do that, Mike, I want people to know a little bit more about you. So go ahead and tell the folks who Mike Duran is. Well, I, I'm an ex-pastor. I'm an ex-pastor in that I pastored for a little over a decade and then left the ministry, went back into the workforce and uh, through that process ended up becoming a writer and I kind of migrated into some different fields of commentary and subject matter. And uh, it's been a fun journey. I'm a husband, father of four kids and grandfather of 12 kids, believe it or not. So Oh my gosh, 12 <laughs> grandkids? Oh my goodness. Actually, <laughs> actually our 12th is still in the uh, in the oven, but uh, she'll be here in another couple of months. Lord willing. We should just call you Father Abraham. There's your 12 tribes right there. Oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love it, Mike. I love it. Also, you didn't say that you also dabble in uh, art. Oh yeah, yeah. I do a lot of art and um and uh, do uh, mixed medium as well as uh, wall crosses. I, I enjoy making wall crosses. And, uh, but I've really got into kind of clay and um, shadow boxes lately. So I'm seems like I'm constantly fiddling with some kind of new uh, invention out there. And uh, I'm enjoying it. It's, I feel blessed that God's given me the opportunity to be able to, um, you know, to do some creative things like that. So. My so question good. is when you, as a creative, so you are a creative as a creative, as an author, and you're also creative as a artist, which mm -hmm. do you prefer or is it based on your mood? What's the differences? It's really quite different. That's an interesting question because I find, uh, for instance, writing is somewhat more difficult, especially fiction writing is a lot more difficult. I really enjoy, I probably read more nonfiction than I do fiction. And I really, you know, uh, find writing nonfiction has been something that I've found more enjoyment doing than in creating fictional worlds. And really to, to write fiction requires uh, a lot more, you know, you have to plot, you have to develop your characters, you have to develop a story arc. It's difficult getting all that stuff in a cohesive form on paper and so a lot of times i'll go to my physical art you know painting and crafting as a means of more relaxation than writing writing feels like more work and whereas the crafting feels like much more recreative so it's an interesting balance because i i kind of move from between one or the other you know when i'm getting uh, locked up in my brain writing, I'll, you know, go out to my workshop and work on something and it really is more leisurely and gives me a bit more of a, of a break. So one would say that when you write, you're actually writing to present a message to someone, whether it's through fictional or non-fictional means. There's a message being presented, but with the physical art, it's more so to relax your mind, get your mind clear from all that. And I can see that. I could totally see that. I know when I knit and when I cook, especially, it is so calming. Everything can be going wrong in the world. But if you get my knitting needles and I start cooking for my family, 
it just all smooths away because I love to cook. I can't bake worth anything. Every time I try to bake things, they just get destroyed. But when I cook, cooking is something I'm very good at. My father taught me how to cook and I find a lot of relaxation in that. Whereas my sisters, they hate cooking and they're looking at me like, so you made beef brujol, which is a very difficult Italian dish, right? And well, not difficult, but it's a very time intensive Italian dish. And yeah, I was fine with it. it. Took four hours because I made everything from scratch and I didn't prep anything. But by the time it was done, I was it was very calming for me. And they're like, "Yeah, give me the can of Chef Boyardee." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I totally understand that. But I love writing. I love writing. Writing is my relaxation, just like reading is my relaxation. So I totally understand you there. Now, one thing, um, dear listener, you should know about Mike, Mike has sort of made himself a name as someone who talks about Christians utilizing fiction to tell stories, but not just any fiction. Most people, when they think of Christian fiction or even religious fiction, they think of Amish fiction or Amish romance, which I have no idea why, <laughs> but uh, they think of that. But Mark, Mark, Mike, rather, he thinks of horror. And a lot of people, when they hear that, they go, horror? you can't have Christians and horrors going together. And then of course, Mike would beg to differ. So when did this synchronization, if you will, of understanding the horror genre as a acceptable vehicle to tell Christian stories came to you? Yeah, that's a, that's a long story. And it's not something that I chose to do. Like I became a Christian and decided, hey, I'm going to write about horror, the subject of horror, it was more a subject that developed by um, starting to write, uh, you know, uh, determining to become a professional writer, and then my interactions with the Christian publishing community and Christian readers, and that's when I began to realize that, hey, some of the subject matter that I gravitate to and that I like is not really acceptable in the evangelical writing community. And so I began to ask, why? Why is that? Why do, you know, why is the evangelical writing community tilted towards clean fiction or inspirational fiction? Why is it tilted towards historical romance? Why is it predominantly, uh, you know, women's fiction? You know, what are, what are some of the dynamics that are shaping the evangelical publishing industry? And, and that's, it opened up like a whole other discussion about, uh, you know, the state of Christian writing, the uh, the state of evangelicals and art and art appreciation and their understanding of art. See, a lot of my um, uh, grab a lot of the re one of the reasons that I'm gravitate that I gravitate towards horror is actually because of my time in the ministry, Parker. There was, you know, I encountered a lot of weird stuff in the ministry. I don't think we talk about this enough, but, um, you know, I encountered, uh, you know, like I remember once having a, uh, a woman in our congregation come to me and say that she believed that a succubus was attached to her husband. Interesting. Well, I, had, I had no idea what a succubus was. I had to go look it up. And a succubus is a female demon. And apparently the husband was into all kinds of pornographic and bondage, weird stuff. And she was actually felt like there was a presence in her home because of that. Now, what is a, a pastor supposed to do in that situation? And similarly, I had, you know, I've had uh, church members come to me and talk about having a ghost in their house. You know, so, so how do pastors deal with that? And then on top of that, the many times that, as a pastor, we have to deal with death, with tragedy. We had a, a, a close friend in our church commit suicide, and it was an awful, awful, traumatic event in the church. And when I began to see that, I mean, the, the church and church life, life is not a bed of roses, but then as Christians and the Christian art community, we want this, like, Thomas Kincaid type of life. We want, you know, flowers and butterflies and sunrises and rainbows and stuff and we don't we tend to want to shy away from discussions of the depression the the the, the haunting <laughs> you know the the accidents the you know the horror of, of dealing with 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 uh with cancer
cancer or with suicide or divorce. There's so much dark stuff in the church. And mind you, I mean, God promises to deliver us and to, and to walk with us through those things. But I was always uh, surprised, or I found myself being more surprised that we talk less about walking through the valley of the shadow of death than the scripture does. The scripture addresses dark subject matter on a regular basis. Well, so, people always talk about the fact that if you want to read a horror story, you can read it in the Bible because there are yeah. some dark things there. And they've talked about rape. They've talked about uh, incest and all sorts of things that happen in the Bible. So you mm -hmm. can't just sit here and say that these things don't happen in real life. And to your point there, Mike, which I would love to talk about, you mentioned about people having ghosts in their home. You mentioned about having a succubus. And these are realities I think some churches are not equipped with because they do want to keep it light and fluffy as if one, the spiritual world does not exist. Two, mm -hmm. as the spiritual warfare is not a real thing. And three, that we are more than spirit, than natural beings in the earth. We are actually, um, I think we're like fish in the water. We experience these things like a fish, like a fish can jump out of the water for a few moments, but it can't stay in there. So when we experience these entities and these sorts of very interesting incidences, we have to acknowledge that there is more to the pond than what our mm -hmm. narrow existence shows us. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, that leads to our discussion today, dear listener, about quantum mechanics multiple dimensions and ghosts. So let's go ahead and just dig into that. Now, for, for sure, this is a huge sci-fi trope that happens in movies and books, wouldn't you say, Mike? Oh, absolutely. It's got, I mean, it goes back to into the, the 50s and 60s when they started experimenting more with some of these tropes of uh, dimensions and wormholes and things like that. I, in fact, I was thinking about it this morning I used to love the Twilight Zone, and as a kid, I always watched the Twilight Zone. And there was one episode in the Twilight Zone that came to my mind, and it it was uh, named something like "Little Girl Lost." I love that one. I just saw that recently. It was "Little Girl yeah. Lost." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And remember, there was like a didn't like a wormhole just kind of randomly open up in her room, and yeah. she crawled through it, and her husband or her, her, her father rather had to go into that other dimension and get her and so this subject's been being toyed with for for quite a while in um in film and in literature and it's actually kind of exploded which is a which is a interesting phenomenon itself parker because um if you think about it what when, when science when science ruled the day and ruled the conversation we would believe that matter was all there was. The world just consists of matter. It, you know, what you can see, what you can feel, what you can touch. You know, that's what the world is. And everything that we are is just a bunch of physical components uh, and, and atomic structure and this or that. And science has slowly changed and migrated into a belief that no, there's stuff out there that we just have no idea what's going on. And quantum, the field of quantum physics is one of those fields where, uh, you know, physicists and scientists have begun to realize that at the subatomic level, uh, the world operates a lot more strangely than we ever really imagined. And that kind of move away from a materialistic, you know, belief in a materialistic universe to a belief in a much bigger, stranger universe has kind of, that has moved us more into the discussion of biblical truth than the previous, you know, the secular materialist kind of uh, point of view. So, uh, and so when you see, like, you know, I was just thinking about this today too, remember um, the popular series Par Paranormal Activity? Oh, and yes. And one of their, you know, one of their recent, or one one of the series was called the Spirit Dimension, and so you have a lot of fictional tropes now mining this idea that there are other dimensions or there's other realms that we can't see, 
but can we can access and which can impinge upon our experience. And so whether it's ghosts or it's demons or it's a parallel universe type of thing. Uh, and then oddly, there is, you know, more and more scriptural evidence that that uh, multiple dimensions actually jive with uh, a biblical worldview. It's fascinating that you mentioned this, and I'm going to, I recently downloaded a crud load of old sci-fi short stories from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. And one of the stories I finished reading, I think last week, was a story by, um, what's the guy's name? Uh, Jack Williamson. He's one of my favorite um, old-time authors from back in the day. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. one was in 19, was this 1944? Mm -hmm. I think it's 1944, and it's called The Pygmy Planet. No, I'm sorry, 1932. It's from Astounding Stories, February 1932. And for anyone interested in getting these stories, the Gutenberg Project online has made them all available. They've um, made e-copies of, of all of them. They don't have a copyright on them, so they can download them for free. And in the story, the gentleman is shrunk to very small size. And he goes to this planet that this mad scientist made called the Pygmy planet. And he experiences time differently as mm -hmm. a smaller human being than he would if he was full adult. And right here, you have this convergence of dimensions happening right here. So even though as a, as a, as in our, in our world, only a minute would have passed, but for him, because he's so small, it took him like three hours to go from one part of the table to the other because he had a, the scientist had shrank a little t uh, airplane to go to the pygmy planet. And mm -hmm. the pygmy planet was the size of a, a thimble or something, but to get there it took him three hours. Whereas if he had been big, it would have taken him less than a second to walk across to the table. So mm -hmm. you have this happening here. And so the scientists were, scientists have been really fascinated by the subatomic world because like you said, weird things happen on a subatomic world. And another well-known pop culture movie that depicts this is Ant-Man because mm -hmm. yeah. when he shrank to subatomic levels, I, I, I forgot the actual title, when he shrank for the first time ever, I was able to understand exactly what they meant because when he shrank so tiny, of course, mm -hmm. time would have no meaning for him. Mm -hmm. of course, and, and I love how they depicted that. So you saying that there are multiple dimensions actually is in line with biblical truth. Mm -hmm. And I use the example again, like a fish out of water, a fish can jump out of the water and live out of the water for a few minutes. And life for him out of the water is much more different than life for him in the water. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so we're talking about that. But now we got to talk. We talked about multiple dimensions. We talked about the quantum mechanics and quantum physics. But now we got to talk about ghosts. How does this all <laughs> come together, Mike? Uh, I don't know if it does. <laughs> you know what? My first book that <clears throat> was actually I, that I ever got contracted is a book called The Resurrection. And I had a difficult time shopping that book in the Christian market because it features a ghost. Now, I ended up uh, kind of tweaking the character to be a little bit more like a phantom. But one of the problems that I quickly learned was that evangelicals don't do ghosts. And the reason why there's kind of a, a common narrative, in fact, they had this uh, discussion, a friendly discussion with a, a commenter on my Facebook uh, page where I was talking about ghosts just last week. And he said, what is the standard line among many evangelicals is that ghosts are demons. Now, <clears throat> I use, we talked about the story of the witch of Endor as an example. And that's in, I'm not sure if it's Second Samuel, it's in one of the Samuels, I believe, but it's when the, you know, uh, the king, the evil king at that time, Saul, was seeking wisdom. Now, necromancy had been banned in the land, but he was seeking some wisdom, and in desperation, he went to a witch at Endor to speak to his former friend, <laughs> the prophet Samuel, who was dead. And according to the story, the witch 
summons up the spirit of Samuel, and both of them are shocked and surprised that Samuel actually shows up and prophesies against um, Saul. And the question is, what is, you know, what is happening there? What state was Samuel in? Where was Samuel existing? Or in some cases, as the commenter that I was talking about previously, as, as he mentioned, he believes Samuel or the spirit of Samuel was actually a demon. Now, I don't think in the context you can, uh, that you can actually reach that conclusion because for one, the Bible doesn't say it was a demon. The Bible actually calls the spirit Samuel. And secondly, the spirit prophesies against Saul, which again, you would have to conclude that a demon was prophesying against uh, Saul. So there's some reasons to believe it is actually a ghost, but that messes with our theology, Parker. You know, that messes with our theology big time. And it's similar to um, when Jesus was resurrected. When Jesus was resurrected, um, there was an instance where the disciples, you remember, are huddled in their house. They're frightened, like, what the heck is happening? And Jesus walks through the wall. And, <laughs> and you remember they said, it's a ghost. Yeah. And what, what does Jesus say? He says, I'm not a ghost. A ghost doesn't have flesh and blood. And he said, touch me and see. And then he, I think he even requests some fish. He said, look, I'm going to eat too. The ghosts eat. But that instance, that uh, encounter is quite interesting. For one, Jesus doesn't rebuke them for believing in ghosts. He, Jesus didn't say, you silly guys, there's no such thing as ghosts. What did he say? He said, I'm not a ghost. A ghost doesn't have flesh and blood like me. Okay, so it's almost as if in that culture, ghosts were accepted and Jesus saying, I'm not that. I am of a completely different order. In fact, in that sense, we see what is probably a, a, a premiere of what the resurrected human body will look like. Because Jesus was, not only was he physical, he was a physical material uh, being, but in that state, he was able to pass through a solid object without damaging the object or himself. So, I mean, the Bible says when we see Jesus, we'll be like him. And that was part of what the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 and the resurrection of the body, that we are going to possess new bodies. And it's almost as if that was, like I said, a prequel or a, a preview of what our new bodies will look like. But surprisingly, the Apostles the first said, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. Now, I, I think I need to be clear too that scripture is very clear that necromancy is a sin contacting the dead is is directly condemned by god and no christian in any manner should be seeking to contact a dead person or come in contact with spirits and tension. there's no way however what you know where spirits reside after they die is not 100% clear from my perspective in Scripture. Yes, the Bible says that to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord, but then you've got stories like Samuel, the witch at Endor, or you've got stories like, for instance, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. In, at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is glorified, and two dead prophets show up, and it says they have a conversation with him. It was... Who is it? it? Was Moses and Elijah are in conversation with him? Yeah. And, you know, when you say that, I can't remember having the same sort of rigid understanding as well, because that's what I haven't taught. Things changed when my grandmother passed away uh, two years ago. Things changed. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple of things happen that it didn't rock my world or anything. It didn't rock my world. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. But I said, granny's here. And not here, like standing in front of me, you know, talking like that, but it, I can't really explain it. But even my sisters had dreams about her and the dreams weren't memories. They were new. And 
I'm sitting here going, well, is I don't think it's a, I don't think this is demonic, you know, you know what I'm saying? So it, it's been a little bit, uh, interesting having some of my very hardwired, uh, thoughts sort of, uh, shaken by it, some of the things I experienced, you know what I mean? It's, it's interesting that you bring that up because yeah. I had a conversation just last week. We have some close friends that were a member of our church and the husband contracted ALS and kind of suffered with ALS. And you know how that's an incredibly debilitating disease. Mm -hmm. And then he finally passed away. So I had called her. She, she moved to uh, Texas. And so I called her last week just to, you know, offer condolences and to talk to her. And it was interesting because one of the first questions she asked me, Parker, was, do you think my husband can see me right now? And it's a fascinating thing because I've seen this. I've had, you know, as a pastor, I've dealt a lot with grief, and then we've seen friends, and close ones, move on. And there's this odd sense that when a person leaves, they are more present than they ever were when they were here. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure that I can have uh, biblical, uh, you know, proof text for that. But it's because it's an odd spiritual psychological phenomenon and anyway so when this uh, my friend asked that do you think my husband knows what's going on here and i said you know in hebrews 11 it talks about a great cloud of witnesses it says let's run with patience the race that's set before us and, and the scripture talks about this great cloud of witnesses they're the exactly. saints mm -hmm. the saints that have went on before ahead of us and it says they're watching us they're cheering us on. Now, is that just a metaphor, or are we to believe that they, I mean, when when Samuel, the prophet, was brought back from the dead, he knew exactly what to tell Saul, as though he was aware of what's going on. And then there's another, ver uh, another verse, I believe, it's, it's in the book of Revelation, but I'm not sure what the chapter is, but it's it's a, a, a glimpse into, it, it talks about the souls of the martyrs who are under the altar, and the souls of the martyrs under the altar are crying out to God, when will you revenge our blood? And it's another little glimpse into this idea that here's souls that have passed on. They're definitely present with the Lord, but they also have a sense of what's going on on earth. Lord, when will you revenge our blood? As it's an awareness, I think, of the, of our world, you know. And when um when I had a dream about Granny, um she didn't talk to me in the dream. She didn't talk to me, but she was with me, and I needed her presence. But in my sister's dream, when she dreamt about her, she was very. She said, "I've been allowed to come and talk to you," like something like that. I can't remember the whole full words, and. It was as if we were getting the impression the Lord had allowed my grandmother to come. And again, it, it kind of rocked my world a little bit because I knew how, how I was raised to completely avoid it, um, the ghosts or demons, but there was nothing dark about that, if I can say it like that. And um, mm -hmm. I was I was I wanted to get some clarity on it, but then I said, well, I'll just leave it alone <laughs> for right now. I don't want to get to, I don't want to get to because you still got to protect your your spiritual um you don't want to get to dabbling the things you don't want to get to dabbling into. Yeah, uh, and I, th I think that's the actually one of the important points that I feel like we need to make in discussions like this. The Bible explicitly condemns talking to the dead and seeking out the dead. I think sometimes there's a resistance to considering these alternate possibilities because of the fear that people are going to, you know, they're going to want to contact their dead husband. They're going to want to make you know, a contact with, with the dead relative. And the Bible explicitly, you know, condemns that. But, I mean, the truth is, is that we just live in a world that is strange. And there's invisible components to the world. You know, that story of, uh, gosh, is it in Kings or First Kings? I'm sorry, I don't have chapter and verse for some of these things. But remember the story of, of Elijah and Elijah's servant. And they're surrounded by the enemy. And Elijah's servant is freaking out. We're dead. We're done. We're toast. And Elijah said, it's over, man. Game over. Yeah. <laughs> right. and, and Elijah prayed, God opened his eyes. And the scripture says that the servant's eyes were open and the, the hills surrounding them 
were filled with chariots of fire. And there's a real sense. I mean, the Bible's clear that we live in a world that all around us, there's witnesses, there's people watching us. And who knows from day to day how many glorious, fiery chariots are surrounding us. And Amen, Mike. That will preach. Amen. <laughs> I just I just felt the tingles go through me when you said yeah. that. You know, I, I, when you said that too, it, it reminded me of experience I had um, and this comes with the spiritual, um, spiritual state. Um, I have been very angry at a family member for some time. And I had what's called a uh, cold rage against them. Mm -hmm. And during that cold rage, I was still going to church, still having a good time, still, you know, doing, doing life, you know, but this cold rage settled in me and, um, the Lord, I forgot how it happened, but I remember, uh, being with the Lord and the Lord told me that I had unforgiveness in my heart. And I did. And so I, I had to ask the Lord to forgive me for my unforgiveness. Right. And uh, in that moment, I felt a physical sensation, I'm sorry, a physical sensation of something cracking over my heart. And when that happened, I felt light as air. I thought I was about to hit the ceiling because I was first, I was praising the Lord. First of all, I was giving him thanks. And I was, you know, praising the Lord and everything. And I thought I was about to hit the ceiling. Like I can remember feeling like I was floating. Nothing, again, nothing weird. I don't want to <laughs> give the impression like I'm doing weird things. This was in a, a moment of um, communion with the Lord. And so I shared this story with another lady. I was sharing the story some years later. I shared the story with her. She said, oh my gosh, Parker, did you read my book? I said, girl, I couldn't get your book. Somehow, you know, like that. And she said, she had been angry at her mom. Her mom had abused her when she was a child and used to beat her and all this other kind of stuff. And she had unforgiveness in her heart toward her mom for many, many years. And she expressed the exact same thing I had expressed too. And I share this experience to show you that we may not be able to see the spiritual realm, if you will, but it does exist. And what me and her felt were physical manifestations of, I, I would say like a, a spiritual state, like unforgiveness, for example. Um, you may say it better than I do, Mike, so correct me where I'm wrong. Um, but these things are real. That's the point. And it's hidden. And I think the Lord hides it for our protection because if yeah. we saw some of the spiritual warfare, we'd probably run from the house screaming. <laughs> you know what I mean? But go ahead, correct me if I have it wrong, Mike. I don't mind being corrected at all. You know what? I've come to the point in my life, Parker, where there are, you know, the, the world we live in is so big and there's experiences that people have that, you know, unless it's ex unless something is explicitly condemned in scripture, I am not going to sit in judgment of people having odd experiences. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about being caught up into the third heaven. And he, a couple of times he says, was I in the body or out? I didn't even know. You know, uh, there's the story of uh, Philip and the, the Ethiopian eunuch where Philip was transported. It just yep. like he was bodily transported. Now, mm -hmm. what's going on there? The Bible doesn't give us, uh, uh, you know, any ideas. The Bible talks about seraphim one time. There's one reference to seraphim in the Bible, and it opens up this whole category of angelic beings. And anytime we get a glimpse of the angels in scripture, it's like incredible where, you know, there's multi-winged, multi-eyed uh, beings that exist in the heaven realm. And so I think you're right in the sense that God probably does uh, cloak our eyes to keep us from being overwhelmed. I mean, anytime in the scripture that someone saw Christ or an angel, they were just overwhelmed. You know, they fell down. In fact, God told Moses, he said, you can't see me and live. You remember Moses was saying, God, oh, yep. And the Lord let him see his hind parts so and he couldn't yeah. handle that. <laughs> so. Yeah. And who knows what God hide, God's hind parts are, but that's a fascinating concept there. So anyway, my, my point is that the world is bigger. It's more mysterious. It's more awesome than we can ever imagine. And there is a sense sometimes that we come to the scripture wanting all the answers. But instead of the Bible, coming to the Bible and our world shrinking, in other words, now I understand it. Now the world's more manageable. I think just the opposite is supposed to happen. When we come to the scriptures, our minds are blown. 
The world is bigger than we could have ever imagined. And there's more mystery in our world than we can ever imagine. And we need to make room for that, Parker. I think we need to make room for God to open our eyes to see the mountains and the hills are surrounded with chariots of fire. Hey, so, man. So. Oh, Mike, every time you say that, I just feel it. <laughs> me. it just, <laughs> it, it, and I like that you say that. And and I should be very clear. I did not seek out some sort of experience. I need to make that very clear. These things happen while I was Mm -hmm. talking to the Lord. I wasn't, there were no crystals, no Ouija boards, no, (laughs) none of of that. Uh, I remember when someone bought a Ouija board to school though, Mike, I -hmm. was in fifth grade. I'll never forget it. I was in fifth grade and um, someone, you know, we had, you know, game day and someone bought a Ouija board and you know, when I look back on it, I go, why did someone bring a Ouija board? We're in fifth grade. Who's playing around with Ouija boards? You know? But you don't think about that at the time. And I actually went towards it because, of course, you're a kid. And I knew I wasn't supposed to. I knew it, right? My mom and dad told me very early, no. So we went toward it, whatever. And uh, at first, he brought clown in with it, you know. Then I was like, come on, stop it. We're going to do it for real. We're do it for real. So we did it for real. And that thing moved. Hey, you talking about a bunch of kids scattered like a bunch of roaches. <laughs> we scattered like roaches, literally. Like the, like the light turned on, the roaches came to <laughs> scatter. And I said, Laura, if you protect me, I'll never do it again. Never do it again. Never do it again. <laughs> and um, you find out too, especially these YouTubers who do paranormal content, these YouTubers, they talk about how um, they experience um, things when they have Ouija boards. Okay. And this goes into our topic about dimensions, multiple dimensions and how uh, it's quite possible. There are mythologies, if you will, that allow entrance into our world. See, so how would you frame that into a coherent thought? Because my coherence is, is, is gone. So how would you frame that, Mike? As we, are we getting ready to close, Mike, but I wanted you to just kind of touch on that too. You know, one thing that's real fascinating is, remember I had mentioned how in previous decades, materialism was more the the predominant worldview. In other words, matter is all there is. You know, evolutionary theory was birthed out of this idea that matter could just generate and self-generate and morph, et cetera, et cetera. But as we've developed more of an understanding about the nature of our universe, it's opened the door to spiritual realities and spiritual possibilities. Now, we are experiencing right now a resurgence of interest in the occult, in spiritism. I think during the pandemic, they, you know, they called it the, uh, oh gosh, there's a name for it. it, was like the pandemic explosion or something. In other words, there was a, occultism, witch talk, you know, TikTok for witches exploded and more and more people are seeking occult means. They're seeking, uh, um, you know, alternative spirits and things like that. And this is an important time for us Christians because we are saying that the spirits, spirits are out there. Entities, you know, intelligent agents who are invisible are out there. They're all around us. But we're also saying that evil spirits exist. The Bible tells us that there's such a thing as good doctrine and there's such a thing as doctrines of demons. So there are thoughts, ideas, practices, beliefs that originate in a dark spiritual realm. So so part of the quantum, you know, coming into realization of, 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 of the nature of our, you know, the strange nature of our universe has opened this door for more people who are probing into spiritual realities, but are bent on and are le- and are moving towards spiritual deception. And so I, so I think our message as Christians need to be clear is that, you know, the spiritual world is real, but it also can be really, really dark. And you need to be careful when you're seeking out spiritual means that you're on the right side of, of you know, of, of the invisible. And so and that's what the scripture does. The scripture lays out, gives us parameters for, 
You know, what, you know what, what is a deceiving spirit? How can we tell a deceiving spirit? How can we know what a doctrine of a demon is? Well, the scripture talks about that. So I think that's an important element to all this too, is that, you know, we make room for spiritual phenomenon, but we're also not gullible. We don't believe every spirit, like the Apostle John said, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. And that testing, I think, is the, uh, an important element of you know Christian discernment. And it's a test of scripture because scripture will tell us because the scripture is what we use to test those spirits. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is a very important part of the conversation. But Mike, once again, thank you for being with me. I know we just scratched the surface of this very <laughs> fascinating topic, but we had a good time doing it. And dear yeah, listener, yeah. if you want us to talk about it again, all you got to do is let me know. We definitely will. I'll have Mike's information below where you can con connect with Mike. And then remember, he'll be back with us again, not actually, not just in this month, but he's going to be with me in December, I think, because we're going to talk about his other book with this uh, Cthulhu. Isn't Cthulhu on the front of the cover of that book, Mike? I don't recall. I have to check my calendar. <laughs> oh, am I just making this up? <laughs> I might just be making this up as I go along. But Stop making stuff up. <laughs> just making stuff up. But either way, we'll have you back to talk about your other book. That's the one where you said not every conspiracy is a theory. And it looks oh, like Cthulhu. Oh. Um, yeah, that that is that is Cthulhu person. <laughs> oh yeah, that is a Cthulhu. How how you say? Look, I don't know how Lovecraft came without his names, but uh, I'll call it Cthulhu. But if it's something else, oh yeah, just correct me in the comment section there. But um, yeah, but I'm so glad Mike and he'll be with us again to close out our series later on this month. Mike, thank you so much, dear listener. Thank you for joining in on this conversation, and we'll be back again real soon. <laughs>